Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Calvary Chapel Red Wing. It's really fun to be here when you got to make the announcement for the new building. That's just such a joy. I know in our fellowship we're praying about it. We're way smaller than you guys, so I'll just kind of let you know. Um, but our fellowship started as just, hey, if you want to come over on Sunday nights and go through the Bible together, we can do that. And then we've grown. And, and a lot of you, Mike's had me come and be a guest speaker before, so you kind of get updates every year or so as to what's going on down there. And I get, I'm still just stunned by what God can do um, without my help, you know, and he can just do it. So there is a power in the Word of God. And normally when I come and share with you all, um, I will... I will take what I'm teaching at the Bible study that week and just share it with you. But something, this time Mike was like, teach on whatever you want. And I said, you know, I, I got to tell you what's really been on my heart with Israel under attack and, and before that the COVID stuff and, and before that um, just nonsense everywhere. Uh, I got to go back to the covenant. And, I, and my heart's been back in Exodus chapter 19. So if you got your Bibles, actually we'll go old school. How many people got a Bible with them right now? Okay, if you don't, you got to trust me, and that's dangerous. You know, you got to trust that what I'm reading is actually what's there, and I think sometimes you will see through a lot of stuff when you go hear speakers when you just have a Bible in your hand. Look it up with it. So we'll be in Exodus 19 this morning. I'm just going to pray one more time before we start digging into God's holy word, okay? Dear Lord Jesus, be with us. May your spirit be here. May your spirit move in our hearts. Lord, if there's any distraction, any sin, any garbage getting in the way, clear it out. Return us to your salvation. Purify our hearts. Seek in us any wicked way and get it out because we want to hear your word and we want to hear it without any tarnish or any blemish. So Lord, purify us this day as we come before you and open your word. Teach us through your word. Help me to get out of the way so that your message can go through to the hearts that you've prepared, Lord. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. Exodus chapter 19. Here it is. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, and on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and they camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. Do you feel like they're saying that like in three different ways? They camped there. They went there. They stayed there. This is a big deal in Exodus so far. Uh, Exodus is a reflection on our walk with God. I'm just going to like say, when you read through Exodus, it is the journey of the Christian in a, in a narrative form. It's also history. And God delivered through history a message on how our lives are going to go when we walk with him and what it looks like. So in the, it, it, he, God has delivered them. It's in the past tense. It's already done. We're at that stage of the Christian walk. God's already redeemed these people. He's paid the price to take them as his own, and he's gathered his own kingdom. Uh, they don't have a land, they don't have an army, they just have songs, and they sing together. Really, Miriam leads them, and they just worship, and they walk around, and that's what they do. And God builds a kingdom out of that. He has delivered, in these people, he's delivered them from Egypt. Leaders that think they're gods. Sound familiar? Leaders that live beyond their means as a human, and he's freed them from that. In fact, le the leaders in Egypt had both men and women wearing makeup. Sound familiar? And he got them out of that culture. And in addition to this, there's a point of contention that was that Pharaoh wouldn't let them go worship together as a body. Sound familiar? God redeems his people when leaders start doing those things. I love this. So guided by God, there's a cloud. They're purged by bitter water. They get the garbage out of them. Frankly, the purging of the bitter waters, have you ever thought of this? Whatever they had eaten in Egypt gets purged by the bitter waters, right? There's nothing left from Egypt. That, you know, you shake the dust off your feet, they're shaking the stuff out of their guts, right? He's purged them. He's gifted them with his food, an image of the word of God, manna. He's gifted them with fresh water from the rock, an image of the Holy Spirit. And he's prayed for victories over the Amalekites. He's led them in spiritual warfare, and their enemies are resolute to attack them, but God's resolute to save, and he's determined to do it. So God leads them through a wilderness. They just follow the cloud, and he creates this relationship with his people. God has prepared them for the promised land, but they're not there yet. Sound familiar? So this walk of Christ that we have, we are redeemed, we are healed, we are purged of our sin, we're giving the bread of the water, we're giving the Holy Spirit, we walk in the wilderness, but we're not home yet. 
And we look around and we're looking to be home. I love this chapter. The reason it's so redundant in verse 1 and 2 is because this is a hinge in the Bible. Okay, now what? What do we do out here in this wilderness area? The word wilderness is in there three times. In the Hebrew, it means driving range. And that's not for golf, and it's definitely not pickleball. But we, there's an area without people where you can drive your livestock. Oddly enough, there's only about 100 million people on the earth at this period of time. There are still parts of the earth that are unclaimed. We made a big planet, and there just aren't that many people. So the Sinai area is an unclaimed pasture land with very few people inhabiting it. Nobody's there to challenge them. They've made their own little space. You'd think God would just leave them there, right? Why not? Why take them to the promised land when they've got grazing land or driving land that they can go to? So they stand before the mountain in Exodus 3, and, and God says to Moses, this shall be a sign that I've sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. In other words, arriving at Sinai is an answer to Moses. It's very intimate. God told Moses, you're going to bring the people here, and here we are not not long later, God has brought the people there, just like he said he would. Jesus said he would send the church to the ends of the earth and that we would gather week after week in his name, sing his praises, pray in his name, and study his word. And here we are this morning doing exactly what he said we would do 2,000 years ago. Isn't that wonderful? In Minnesota, by the way, like we're very far from where he said those things. Kind of the ends of the earth. However, the drive down here with the the colors, you guys in Red Wing, I, I hope you don't not appreciate how gorgeous it is around here. I drove down the Prescott Way just because I wanted the hills and the trees. It was gorgeous. Anyways, this book ends a promise to Moses, right? Here he is where God said he would be. God came to Moses in a burning bush. He's going to come to the people of God from a burning mountain, and that's Sinai. So here we are. We know we're in Midian. It's this area, and just geographically, you know I'm a geek. I get into this stuff. What, when we say Sinai, we're not talking about the Sinai Peninsula of today when you look at a map. We're talking about Saudi Arabia across that other area. And the reason I say that is in Exodus 3.1, um, they talk about the mountains of Horeb, and Sinai is a single mountain amongst a mountain range. That doesn't exist on the Sinai Peninsula. Paul notes that Mount Sinai is in Arabia, Galatians 4.25. Arabia is clearly Saudi Arabia or in that other area. In fact, there's a mountain that by today is called Jebel Alaz, um, which, which, which is the law of God. And it stands there. It's a place where the law was given. They still call it Jebel Alaz. And there is, if you want to go to even modern technology, go to Google Maps and search for Jebel Alaz. And what you'll see is a singular mountaintop in the middle of a mountain range that has been colored black. And it's still there for you to look at today. Thank you, Google. Uh, and you can see this particular mountain that we're talking about. It is a testimony even today, if you want to go look for it. Verse 3, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, You've, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. And how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now they've arrived at Sinai and God's giving Moses a message to say to his people. I don't think the message has changed that much. I bore you out of that situation. I took you out of your sin. I saved you. And the interesting thing about eagles' wings, you know, you want to rise up on eagles. Eagles' wings are about the span of a human. They're huge. And eagles are a unique bird in how they take care of their young. They don't take their young in their talons or in their beak. They take their young and put them on their back. So if anything's hunting from underneath, the eagle takes the blow, not the people on the back. And when they took him out of Egypt, he picks this unique bird in this image of how it, he carries his young. And he says, what I did. God wants to remind Moses, look at what I've done. And today it's the same thing. We have the full revelation of Jesus Christ. Look at what he's done for you. Look at what he's done. Focus on it and think about it. There's a key role that gets played in this whole relationship, this covenant that God's going to make with his people. And the covenant's beautiful. This covenant, by the way, is before the Levites, before the Pharisees, before the law is even given, the covenant is given. God gives the promise before he gives the rule. When you talk to non-believers, don't they focus on the rules first? Like, oh, you can't do this, and you can do this, and you can't. It's like, look, if you're not under the covenant, 
the laws don't apply to you. Why do you care? Right? You're just going to live a destructive life if you keep doing that. But the covenant's what's important here. There's a relationship we want to form with God. Nothing less. So I love that the Bible gives this first covenant. Before God gives the law, he gives the covenant. And God then brings them to himself. The point of the protection is that we are with God, alongside God. From a human flesh, earth perspective, we have God walking with us. If we have eyes to see and ears to hear, we know that. There's confidence in it. Verse 5 says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Is God scared of what's going on with Israel right now? Is he backing off on his plan? Has he left his throne? Everything's going according to plan. Everything's going exactly as he said it would. And people, this is when we wake up. We don't get fearful in this. Oh my goodness, it's, well, maybe if you're not saved, you're getting fearful when you hear this stuff. But we think we get to be this generation to exist when those things are going to happen that were foretold 2,000 years ago. And I know you're going through Daniel. I know Pastor Mike is giving you a dose of what was told and coming every week. But before that was told, there was a covenant. We don't approach prophecy outside the covenant. We approach prophecy from within the covenant. And it gives us eyes to see. If prophecy terrifies you, come back to the covenant with me this morning and look at what the covenant is. And the prophecy won't terrify you so much because God takes care of his people. So if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, it's a key point. I love the fact that God says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is interesting. Priests don't exist in Israel when he says this. So what does he mean, a kingdom of priests? Everybody gets to be a priest? Everyone gets to come before God and mediate before God? The goal of what God has with the covenant in verse, with, with, verse, uh, with verse 6, a kingdom of priests, does not come to fruition until Jesus Christ. Did you know that? Israel's going to birth a new kind of kingdom. It's going to represent God on the earth. And verse 5, you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. He's talking to Israel when he says that. Israel is not, it, when he says this, there's no condition on it. There's no time frame on it. Israel is still a special treasure to God. It's his means of showing prophecy to all the world. And then notice how verse 5 ends. All the earth is mine. Israel is a banner in the middle of human history. It's the only nation on earth that didn't win its land through warfare. It's the only nation on earth that was created in a day with the signing of a resolution. It's the only people on earth that have maintained their identity and their culture despite being spread out without land for generations. It's the only nation on earth, to be quite frank, if you know a lot of Jews, that are as stubborn as they are. It's a unique culture of stubbornness. And I say that with all love. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. There's a secondary part of that promise. Yet in, in, as we move forward to Leviticus 11:44. For I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. It's talking to the priests and the people of Israel. So there's this interesting question I have. Am I a priest or am I not a priest? I know I'm not a Levite, so I'm not a priest of the order of the Levites or the Aaronic priesthood. Jesus was a priest of the order of Melchizedek, according to Hebrews. His priesthood goes before the Levitical priesthood. So in, in Calvary Chapels, we, don't, we call it pastors, a sign of respect. Hey, thanks for sharing the word with me. And we, we, we exist in a, under Jesus Christ as our chief priest and our high priest. And we just become brothers and sisters. What a great place to be. Yet the demand to call ourselves holy because God's holy, then we seek the law. Lord, teach me what I need to do. Find in me any wicked way. Purify my heart because I love you. Not because I'm in you know, some obligation to or because following the law is going to get me to heaven. It won't work that way. So priests serve other people. They're mediators. And the goal of Israel was to be a mediator for the rest of the earth. I read the news this morning. The troops of Israel are on the verge of going into Gaza. And you know what they're doing together right now? They're praying. It's beautiful. I mean, I remember when the attack started and Netanyahu was, we are at war. 
And I'm thinking to myself, be at war with that, but pray. Do it in the name of God because I want to see what happens when they mess with the people of God. Like this is going to be a thing and it won't be pretty. The covenant comes with a responsibility to Israel to be a light, which means they should show God's word to the people. They also have this amazing duty of keeping God's word perfectly for thousands of years. They take this duty seriously. Peter calls the new church a holy nation too. So when Peter calls the church, us, a holy nation, that's blasphemy to the Jewish people. If you don't think Jesus is the new high priest, there is no holy nation. But he says that we are, 1 Peter 2.9, but you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That's referring to me. And you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. The covenant. That's what we're called to do. I'm not called to follow a bunch of laws. I'm called to be holy because God's holy, and he's showing me how to do that. Acts 15, for Moses of the old time had in every city them that preach, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day, Acts 15. You know what the nation of Israel did? They taught the word every week in the synagogues. That's what they did. This is what got their enemies so upset that they met, they worshiped, they sang, they prayed. If you will indeed obey, God makes a covenant and he throws these ifs on the front of it. If you don't obey and you don't follow God, don't expect God's blessing. Don't expect him in your life. Don't expect to have him bear you up on eagle's wings. Jesus calls together a tax collector, fishermen, zealots. He doesn't call Levites. And he calls them to holiness in a special kind of way. It is always the case that God hinges his blessing on devotion, not, not our salvation. We act for blessing. We don't act for our salvation. So when the world gets crazy, I think, what do you want me to do today, Lord? I'm not talking to my Lord about my salvation. That's secured in Jesus Christ. Blood's on the cross. I got it on the doorframe. Sin's thrown as far as the east is for the west. But I want to be a soldier in the kingdom. More importantly, I want to be a priest in the kingdom. I want to serve God because he loved me first. What do I need to do? What's the covenant look like? Again, the model's instructive. They're already freed. They're already saved. They're already loved by God. They did nothing to earn God's grace. Now God asks for their obedience. God asks for obedience after he's done something for you. And you say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. And he says, if you're thankful, obey me, follow me. Don't just read it, read it and do it. You've heard me say that a lot. God establishes the nature of our relationship in Exodus 19. If we obey and keep the covenant, we are his special treasure, right? If you want to know your identity, I'll tell you, you're a special treasure to Christ if you obey the covenant. That's your identity. From the end, from this end, grace flows to anyone who wants it. From God's perspective, anybody can have his grace. From our end, the goal is to seek holiness because we've received grace. God gives the plan before the specifics, and he hasn't really defined what holy is yet, right? The law isn't even given. It's the next chapter. If you flip forward to chapter 20, you'll see the Ten Commandments. You don't, they don't even know what they're supposed to follow yet. It's just a relationship. It's just that I love the Lord. And I, I, I think I've told this story before, but for the, for the sake of the point, I didn't know that stealing was bad when I was a little kid. I thought everything was mine. If I saw candy, I ate it, right? If I saw somebody else's stuff, they left it out assumingly for me. But it was when I was told by my parents, you shouldn't steal, that I, then I started to feel a conscience around stealing everything. And I had to go into my bedroom and empty out the bags of stuff I had taken from around the world, you know, but we don't know the law until it's, we're told the law. And therefore, but the law given after the covenant means the covenant's more important than the law. Jesus taught this. He didn't come to take away the law. He came to fulfill it in a relationship with him. So the spirit of the law is for those that are in the covenant. Let's go to verse 7. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. He wrote, he wrote the law down and he laid it before them. Here's what God wants from us. Then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people of the Lord. Moses is acting as a mediator. He's conveying the words. Elders then will convey the words of God to other people. 
down to groups of 10 back in chapter 18. So if you're hearing the word from me today, this doesn't look like a group of 10. That means you have responsibilities to convey what you hear today to everyone in your life. Talk about it. Share it. Hey, we were in Exodus 19 reading the covenant this weekend. You know, how are you doing today? Good, I'm still thinking about chapter 19. What, they don't go to church with you, so they're like, what's chapter 19? And then you get to tell them. You share it. It, it. The idea of sharing God's word is to share it with other people. And there's this enthusiasm here. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. You have no new believers, they're like that. I'm so excited about the gift of God. We're going to do whatever. And as elders of Israel, they're super excited. They just got saved from the Pharaoh. They're willing to do anything. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. There's this enthusiasm as new believers. God bless these people. But they're going to reveal very quickly how they're absolutely unable to do that. That initial enthusiasm often gets met with the reality of one's own sin. So God can save us from the enemy. He can separate us and put us in the wilderness and get us away from the world. We still, at the end of the day, have this thing called the flesh. So the flesh is like, oh, we're so grateful. We're saved from the enemy. We're saved from the world. We're living different, but we still have to deal with our own sin. That's the covenant. And you can't get away from the covenant. This is the terrifying part of the covenant. You can't just join a group and be saved. So we underestimate God and God overestimate, and then we overestimate ourselves, and it comes out as enthusiasm. The common new believer enthusiasm doesn't have behind it the sacrifice, the discipline, and the work of a lifetime journey with Christ. The finite simply can't reach the infinite. This is kind of apologetics, I guess. But the infinite can reach the finite. We can appreciate God, love God, have enthusiasm for God, but ultimately it's God's job to change our heart. He has to come into our life. There has to be relationship. It's not bad. It's a stage. We initially think we can self, self-improve, and I think this is a good stage for a believer. You, I'm going to fix everything. I'm going to get everything out of my life. And then you go through this backsliding process. Mature believers, you've been through this? Where you, you go back and then you feel bad and you apologize, Lord, forgive me, and then you go back and then you do it. But you're, rest, you're trying to work out the fact that you can't do it on your own. And the only way to learn that is to go through it. And the shame that the enemy wants to bring when people backslide. So the point of it is to put your trust in the Lord. Stop trying to do it yourself. And for humans, it's, we're slow learners in that respect. It's sweet, but it's naive. So we'll do anything God says, and they don't even know what God said yet. They've got to study his word. That comes in the next chapter. With the enemy gone, that's God's doing, and the world far away, that's God's leading. Now they have the third foe, their flesh, and they have to deal with it. We are sinners. It's not that we sin, it's that we are sinners. We have to wrestle with that, and that's the only path towards a relationship with God. The only way to figure it out is to realize God can change that too. He can beat that enemy also. But you've got to give up your life. Jesus says you've got to die to yourself so that he can bear in you a new life in Christ. There's a seed that will grow. Romans 7, 7, what do we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law said you shall not covenant. That's where I started thinking about when I was a kid, stealing stuff. We have to know the law next. The covenant is, I want to serve the Lord. I'm excited to serve the Lord, so learn what he says. Don't make up your own rule set. Romans 7.12 is the promise of a holy priesthood. It comes right after that passage. We're dead to ourselves and condemned, but God yet calls us to be holy priests. Well, that's an interesting thing. Verse 9, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and believe you forever. They want us to believe God's Moses' words forever. So God puts a validation of this mighty cloud there. They can see it. Behold. So Moses told the words of the, pe- of the, the, told the, words of the people to the Lord. Matthew 3.16, when he'd been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, same word, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. God validated Moses, God validated Jesus publicly. This wasn't done in a secret, it wasn't done in a closet, it was done with miracles so that everyone around could realize God wants us to listen to this particular people. 
and we still have his word today because of those validations. God shows his ordination on the prophets, validating them, on the priests with the Shekinah glory, and his anointed kings via the prophets, and he does the same thing on Jesus. The lawgiver Moses, the heavens declare that he's there. There's a cloud, there's Shekinah glory, there's lightning and there's thunder, and it's terrifying to the people. With the priesthood of God, God's spirit fills the tabernacle and the temple. God honors Aaron as a priest and has the sticks that grow fruit. Does the same thing when Solomon founds the temple. Shekinah glory, noise, public, announcement to the world. When we see things moving in the Middle East like they're moving, and the enemies of this world come attacking Israel while they're living their peaceful lives, doing horrible things, I can't wait to see what God's going to do next. What's it going to look like? God's servants are clearly known because they speak God's word and there's no no other authority in their life. So this is the covenant part one. Here's the word, trust it, believe it. Know what it says. Then the Lord said to Moses, verse 10, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Take a bath. (laughs) I like this. It's just honest. Israel just got done with a very long trip. They stink. Take a bath. Clean up. Put order in your life. And let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. The Lord will come down on the third day. Have you heard that before? Here he comes down, but later he's going to come up. That's just God's word. So number one, know what God's going to say. Number two, consecrate. The word consecrate means to live different and set apart. The world's doing this, but we're doing this. Not out of legalism, but because we love the God. Why you got to come to this thing? Do I have to, or do I have to serve my God? Love you, your brother, your sister, but I don't have to do that for you. I have to serve my king. So I have to be here. I want to consecrate. Again, consecration to the world just looks like legalism, but when it's me choosing to do it, it's holy. I give things to God because I delight in my God. And I love to give to my God. I give him my time. I give him my resources. I give him my heart. Then three, wash your clothes. God washes the inside. Washing the clothes is an image of what we're doing on the outside. It's like baptism. Baptism is just a symbol of what's going on in our heart so everybody can see it. So if you're down washing your clothes, getting cleaned up, getting ready, that's an act of honor. And then number four, it says, be ready. Be ready for God's coming. I don't think there's an accident that the third day gets used here. I just, you know, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Get ready for it. When you see the signs of the times, be ready to go. Like, I don't, I don't know if you're going to even have church next week. I'm glad you're getting a building. You're moving forward as though that's going to happen. But like, honestly, are you ready to go right now? Are your hearts clean? Have you washed up? Have you gotten ready? I wouldn't be your brother if I didn't ask those questions. And if those questions are offensive to you, let's pray. Let's get that done really quick. Instead of the shackles of Egypt, we get boundaries from God, right? We're going to live under a law, either the world's law or our law. And my law is God's law. Verse 12, you shall set bounds for the people all around. There's boundaries in the walk of faith saying, take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Don't pretend you're equal to God. Don't pretend that you make rules. And you guys say, well, nobody does that. Yes, they do. I hear it all the time in the church. Well, you know, God's word's pretty on spot with this, but this stuff here, that's culturally contextualized. So I'm just going to distance myself from that part of God's law. Or, you know, that's not loving when we do this and that. You know what? It's not loving to tell people that they're okay in their sin. Because they're not ready to meet their maker when you do that. That's not loving. My son's doing something horrendous. I'm going to tell my son he's doing something horrendous. That's love. Love is sometimes to offend the easily offended. And then see what happens. And hopefully have a heart of joy around it. Don't do it in hate, spite, bitterness, none of that. Just do it wanting to see how they react and giving it all to the Lord. Don't pretend you're equal to God. Don't go walking up to his mountain thinking you know what you're doing, thinking that your law is, supersedes what's in the book. If you're still at that point where you and the book are trying to find agreement, get over yourself. You're not God. If the Bible steps on your toes, what do you do? Move your toes. 
right? And it's one of those things. Verse 13, no hand shall touch him, but he shall be surely, shall be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. We're going to come close to God, but we're not going to pretend that we are God. Don't do that in other people's lives either, right? Don't think that because what you're doing to consecrate your life is what God's telling that other person to do. Like, be careful with that. Be really careful with that. Searching for Mount Sinai, great video if you want to see it, shows the stones about around Jamal Allah's, that the stones uniquely are burnt from the outside, but when you crack them open, they're like a sand color, right? So what, if you haven't seen it, it's an old video, Searching for Mount Sinai. You should watch it, look at it. But this idea of like what's going to happen and where God's boundaries are, in this video, they actually find what they think are the boundary stones all around the base of this mountain. They're still there. They weren't small stones. It wasn't like a little stack of stones at the park. These were big, huge markers. God gave us big, huge markers. Don't kill people. Don't steal from people. Right? Next chapter, just read ahead a little bit. Big, huge markers. Number five, accept God's boundaries. We say, we'll serve you, God. We'll do this. And God says, okay, get rid of these things out of your life. Okay, I can back off on that. It's a preparation or a service or a test so that we can be ready to meet God. And we do that with all devotion, with all rigor, with all seriousness. Usually, God, I think, starts with new believers and he goes after something fairly innocuous. Are you willing to give this up for me? You, every one of you, you know what that is because God did it with you, right? Are you willing to dump this? For me, it was my music. I was, I was into 80s metal. I had closets full of it. And something in my heart said, that stuff is not good, right? And the church was like, it's demon music. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I've got a plastic, black plastic glad bag before they had the draw straps. And I filled the bag, brought it down to the dump yard, and threw it on the pile. And I went back home, and everything in my heart is, I could go back and just grab YouTube's Joshua Tree. That's not even metal. And it's crossover music. And they're still searching. Well, I'm not still searching. I found. Don't go up the mountain. We wonder about what we can do. Just start by not crossing some lines God's given us. It's good. We may feel like going there, we may, but we need to submit those things to God. No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at that last day. When we go to meet God, only Jesus raises us up. We don't. For God's not subject to our approval and his laws are not subject to our equivocation. It's just not the way it works. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and there's a blessing here too. Like this is a better way to live. You talk to your non-believing folks and there's drama and stuff all over and you're like, there's a better way to live. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. No one climbs the mountain except the mediator, Moses. See the mirroring that's going on here? It hasn't changed. Jesus just fulfills it all. Moses is going to stand in the gap for the people. Jesus stands in the gap for us. Nobody gets to be Jesus. Nobody gets to do that. Or surely they'll be stoned. There is a harsh consequence for those that cross those stones. In Romans, we're told that we've all crossed the stone. We've all been God's enemy at some point. We've all done it. And so none of us are more perfect than another. We're just further away from the sin we used to commit. And we're growing and maturing in our faith because we love God. Verse 14. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people, sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Don't come near your wives. Okay, let's be really clear about this for us married folks. Um, be, not being near your wife is not, it, it's a very particular thing that's here. I think God starts with something innocuous, right? Because in other places in the Bible, if you get the whole counsel of God, being married is beautiful. Being connected is beautiful. Being with your wife is a good thing to do. But here God just says, you know what? For three days, I want you to take a break from that. I want you to give up something good so that you can go for something God. And I think often God does this with new believers. Something that it's, we could argue with it if we want, or we could just submit to it. 
right? And God's just like, just do this. So it's a unique situation. God takes a legitimate thing that he created inside of marriage, a beautiful, wonderful part of marriage, and he asks them to take a break from it for three days. Can you just obey me? The reality is they can't. Like, they're going to fail in this. But it's so easy. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud. That's emphatic. You ever been close to a trumpet when it goes off? Trumpets, very loud. Like it's in your ear and you're trying to sleep. So that all the people who are in the camp trembled. Again, God comes publicly to anoint his covenant. It's not a secret. The claim of the miraculous public confirmation of the, the, the people here, no other religion in the world has miraculous public confirmations like Judaism and Christianity. We don't put our faith in a human being that says so. We put our faith in public displays of power from an almighty God. Recorded, documented, and carefully preserved for us to read. And then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. Come meet your God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. And this, I'm going to stand here. Folks, brothers, sisters, I love you. You're going to stand at the foot of the mountain. It won't be Sinai. It'll be the throne of Christ. You're going to stand there. There will be a point where Jesus will call his people home and you're going to stand before Jesus. And in that moment and in that day, are you going to stand on your own works? Your own super laurels? I don't think so. On the way down here from Prescott, when you go over this little bridge and there's a little sign that says Big River. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Have you looked over that bridge? That is a, a mighty favorable name for that little <laughs> brook. I want to get out of my car and go yell at the river and say, how dare you pick the name Big River? You're not big. And I think the river would say back to me, yeah, in the flesh, I'm not very big at all. But I didn't give myself this name. And I think that, you know, you all have a name in heaven that God's given you. You know, God has a plan for your life that's mighty, big. You look at yourself and you got people, accusers like me going, you're not very big. I say that to myself, I'm not very big. But do you know that it, that doesn't matter when God's given you a new name? You are what God calls you. And you are what God's called you to. Moses calls the people to come meet God. We too are called to come and meet God. And it's not going to be the name we gave ourselves that's going to get us there. It's going to be the name somebody else put on us. It's going to be the name Christ puts on us. I hope it's not the name the accuser puts on you. It had to be terrifying. The anticipation, now visible and audit. Put yourself in this scene. You're getting out of your tent. You can see the cloud in the distance and you hear the trumpets and you got to go. And the closer you get, the louder it gets, the more forceful it gets. You've been outside when a thunderclap goes off. You can feel the ozone and feel the pressure of the air. It's terrifying going towards that place. If you're not with the Lord, it is terrifying. It's horrifying. You've got two options. Pretend there isn't a God or pretend that you're bigger than God. Nobody approaches the mountain and there is a God. And those two things put together on the third day, we're starting to see this third day thing now a few times in the Bible. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw a place afar off, Genesis 22. Laban finds out that he doesn't have Jacob, uh, Jacob in his grip anymore, Genesis 20, 31 finds out on the third day. Genesis 34, Simeon and Levi claim justice on Dinah's rapists, and they go out and they make justice happen on the third day. Genesis 40 to 42, the butler and the baker are judged three days after Joseph interprets what's going to happen to them. They're judged. Genesis 42, Joseph lets his brothers out of prison to go redeem Benjamin on the third day. Leviticus 7.18, we bring a peace offering to God. Whatever's left on that altar burns up. There's nothing to bury on the third day. Leviticus 7. Hosea 6.2, on the third day, he will raise us up that we might live in his sight. It's a promise. Consistent promise. If you don't believe Hosea 6.2, there's tons of other third days to show you that God is faithful. God will do what I'm saying, 
you know what happens on the third day with Jesus. Like I, I feel like, I, I, in case there's one person in the room that doesn't know, he actually rose from the dead on the third day, redeeming us from our sin um, and, and bringing his position of prophet, priest, and king into our lives. He's our judge. You know what else happens? On the third day, these people walk up and they're going to meet God and you know they're terrified to do this. There's a trembling in their heart. Read the first verses of the next chapter. They really don't want to come before God. No human should. We should fear God. He's mighty and he's holy and we're not. So he does this in the morning. Jewish days start at sunset. So the fact that it's specific here and says they had to wait through the night and come in the morning when the sun rises, look for me on the third day. And, I, and I, I'm sorry, Lord of the Rings reference. Now going to throw himself and his backing behind Moses as judge and lawgiver, we're going to get a validation of everything Moses writes down, the first five books of the Bible, through the public display of God, a trumpet that is very loud. And all the people who were in the camp trembled. I don't want to just read past that. It's very rare in life that we tremble at things. Every person to a person was trembling. The force of God and the presence of God at, the, at Sinai was overwhelming to people. Thunder, lightning, cloud, smoke, earthquakes, and a trumpet. It's all happening, and Moses says, come towards it. I don't know about you. When I see that, I run away from that kind of thing. Like My natural instinct is to run. No amount of cleaning up, washing of clothes, is going to prepare them for God. They've been obedient to God. They're still trembling. They've done what Moses said. They're still terrified. Our cleanliness doesn't do anything in the face of God. Our hearts have to be cleansed. The more we grow in the love of the Lord, the more that fear is cast out. The more we understand where we're at, we get a peace that we're promised. It passes understanding because it doesn't make sense. But I'm peaceful about going before my maker because I've learned to trust in my king. And my king says, I got you on this one. You're covered. Perfect love casts out fear. You don't have a loving relationship with your Lord. How do you ever experience that? How do you know that? Mature believers, how do you express that to new believers so that they get to understand? How do you testify about that? And that's a question. How do we best share this with people? That there is a peace that's here that comes. There is a hope that comes. And there is a perfect love that starts to come that protects you in this. God can free you. God can lead you. God can show you your sin. He can bring you to the bitter waters. He can give you manna. He can give you living water. He can do all these things for you, but at some point, you can consecrate, you can wash, you can wait on God, you can approach God, you can do everything that they've done and still tremble before God. It's called the fear of the Lord. The covenant has a point, though, for us. The point of the covenant is that we may live in his presence, that we may live in the sight and in the power of an almighty God we can stand. Most people, when they meet God or any version of God, they fall on their face in the Old Testament. Do you notice that Jesus' disciples stood in his presence? God had condescended himself, came from mighty heaven, and put himself in a form that we can actually interact with and be friends with and connect with. That's God's doing, not ours. We don't approach God. God approaches us. We simply repent, obey, and serve. And if you don't obey God, you're obeying something else. Verse 18, now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. You ever seen that deep, black, thick smoke of a furnace? We put all these filters on our furnaces now, you know, because we don't want air pollution. B deep, thick, black smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. Again, this is important where the location of Sinai is. It's not on the, in the sandy Sinai Peninsula. It's in the granite mountains of Saudi Arabia. The, when that mountain shook, it's made of solid granite. This is not an easy-to-move mountain. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, see the emphasis? Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Wow. It would take some special effects to make that happen. Furnace kicks out those smokes. They quake. They can feel it. I want to point out that the ground shakes, right? Moses spoke to God in a burning bush 
in a way he could barely handle it, but now there's an entire mountain burning. Moses has matured since the book. And he's doing exactly what God told him. Before the burning bush, he told God, I can't speak. Before the burning mountain, Moses speaks. There's a change that happens in us. And this is the beautiful part about walking in the faith. You can feel things changing, and the, and the ground is shaking while it happens. Like, honestly, this is pretty solid. We're on a concrete foundation here. In our flesh, we put a lot of faith in this earth we stand on. We think it's pretty solid. We trust in the earth that it's not going to fall. We're not going to crater in and fall down to our depths right here. And so, Please, God, no, none of that. But when the earth starts shaking under your feet, suddenly everything gets put into question. Everything changes. This is where these people are at right now. They see a mature guy in God. We see a mediator in Jesus Christ. And that mediator is saying you can stand before God, but the ground is shaking at the same time. Where do I put my faith? Do I put my faith in the earth I stand on, in my own doings, in my own works? Or do I put my faith in Lord God Almighty? Do I trust that I can approach the flame? So Moses spoke to God in that kind of way. There is a growing up that happens here. The mountain, yes, it's terrifying. The bush is more flannel board friendly. It's more Sunday school ready. But the burning mountain, holy moly, this is mature stuff. 1 Corinthians 13, you know this verse. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I understood like a child. I thought like a child. And when I became a man, I put away childish things. I don't need the burning bush. I'm going to stand before the throne of God. Get me ready, Lord. Prepare my heart for that. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see God face to face. I know, now I know in part, but then I shall know as also I am known. And now abide in faith, hope, and love, these three things, but the greatest of these is love. What do we do in the face of the terror of God? Live in faith, hope, and love. Like the answer is so simple, so counterintuitive. Don't tremble in fear. The crescendo of God's voice, the trumpets get louder and louder and louder. As we go through life, God's voice should get louder in our life. More, more beautiful. Trumpets well played are gorgeous instruments. Trumpets in your ear, not so much. Hebrews 12, 21, Moses says, I'm exceedingly afraid and tremble. Exceedingly afraid and trembling. But with Jesus, we don't have to tremble. That's the whole point. That's the covenant. It's what he's given us. The people hear that God talks to Moses. Now they can see God talks to Moses. We could hear Jesus talk to us, but when he raised from the dead, we could see that he rose from the dead. That's why Christianity hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He rose. If he can beat death, and he promises that you can beat death, I can trust that he's right, because he did it. But the ground quaked greatly. The earth isn't firm, it's shakeable. It's not actually a foundation. Where does the Bible say our foundation is? Jesus. But I'm physical. I experience gravity. I like granite under my feet. I like all my security that I've built for myself. I love my little empire I've made. Is that really secure or will it get shaken to its foundation the day you meet the Lord? The Lord says all of those things fade away. Don't put your treasure in things that rust. Put your treasure in heavenly places where things do not rust and moth does not come and eat. Nothing corrupts what you set apart in heaven. Are you ready to come to the mountain? Like you see the world, honestly, if you don't see prophecy starting to come to fruition in the world, you just need to read more. Like you look around the world, are you ready to come to the mountain? Like it's the only thing I can think. Lord, am I ready? Am I where I need to be? Have you made a covenant with God? Have you done business with your maker? And you guys, it's really easy. Maker's ever present, all over. He knows the depths of your hearts. All you got to do is talk to him. Pray. Have a word. You don't know how to talk to him? Grab a mature believer and we'll help pray with you. Easy peasy. And here's the other thing. Do you even desire God? Do you want God? Or do you want the next album from your favorite band? The next movie from your favorite production house? Or do you want more God? I think for me, that's the toughest thing as I matured as a believer is I stopped wanting the things the world was offering. I started to want the things God was offering. You know what I want? I want worship music on a Sunday morning, even if it's really bad, though yours is really good. 
Now, I want to go to that small church in North Dakota and hear that shrill old lady sing next to me, but her heart is all in for the Lord. Praise God. I love that. And I want to hear the teaching of the word from a person who loves it and adores it. You know, I want to come back to church next Sunday and, well, I, I just get to video stream Pastor Mike's. But man, I just want to hear the word of God. Then what I, you know what I want to do? What my desire in my heart is? I want to fellowship with God's people. I want to hang out. And why is it you always have your fellowship feast the week after I show up? <laughs> hey, it's because Mike wants to eat it all. I seriously think it's been every time I've been here, you're like, next week there's going to be a big feast. Back in my church, we do it every week. We do a agape feast every week. That way I never miss the food. Um, it's really good. Are you ready to meet God? Where's your desire? Where's your heart? When, when your mediator, Jesus, not Moses, calls out and says, come near, are you ready to come near? Yeah. If you're not nodding your head right now and there's any doubt in your heart about that, let's pray. Let's bring that before God. Let's come to the throne and deal with it. Don't wait another day because you're nuts if you don't think it's coming soon. And I'm not going to go picking days or anything like that. Be ready. I don't need to. I can see the signs. I'm ready. I know my time. I have confidence. Verse 20, Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the Moses, mountain, and Moses went up. God's ever-present. When he comes down and he stands on a mountain, he's incarnating. Right? We just don't know the name of God when he's in that form. Moses can approach the mountain because God came down to it. And the Lord said to Moses, he says, he uses a voice, go down and warn the people lest they break through to the gaze at the Lord and many of them perish. Temptation of all people is to set up a visual image of what we think this is going to be. Don't do that. We want a poster to look at, something to worship. God's a spirit. He's supposed to be worshiped in spirit and in truth. We want foundation to stand on, but the ground's going to shake. Do it God's way, not your own way. God's not a painting, a sculpture, a necklace. And, and Moses is told to warn the people, don't do this. Even when they're meeting with God's grace. Why is the law in the next chapter so important? Because we lack the ability to decide what is right and wrong. We will decide whatever is right for us because we're selfish. Then verse 22, and let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. There's no special positions. Even the priests need to consecrate themselves. That's unique of every pagan religion at this time. But Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. Moses is saying, we got this. And the Lord's saying, no, you don't. You're not quite there yet. Then the Lord said to him, verse 24, Away, get down, and then come up, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people, and he spoke to them. He becomes an Old Testament image of a mediator that comes down to speak to the people and tell us how it is. That's why we study what Jesus says. But boy, if you skip the Old Testament, you lose a lot of gravitas behind Jesus. Ground quakes greatly. Paul made commentary on the ground quaking greatly too. If you want to flip with me to Hebrews 12, this is an image of a shaking in the same way that Moses is an image of Christ. There's a shaking that's going to happen. Uh, there was a shaking, by the way, uh, when, when the cross happened. There was a, a shaking on the earth um, at various occasions throughout the word. It's an interesting study. Crossing rocks in a field is not a sin. Crossing boundary stones that God has made, now that's a sin. It's a sin because God said so. Why can't we do this? Why can't we do this? Our answer is, because God said so. I'm just going to do what God said. What difference is, if it's really not a big deal, why not just obey God? Right? If it doesn't make a difference, let's just do it God's way. So it's, we do this, but there's a quaking that happens. Hebrews 12 Verse 25 through 29, there's shaking that happens there. I'm going to go back to verse 18. For you've not come to the mountain. See how Paul uses this image from Exodus 12, 19? You haven't come to the mountain to be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest. That's not why we approach God, to get burnt up. Verse 19, and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the words so that those who heard it begged that the words should not be spoken to them anymore. 
This is our journey too. We get close to God. Some of those things are hard to hear. Now you all know that this entire teaching was plagiarizing Paul because he already taught this. For they could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as the beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned and shot with an arrow. Paul's quoting chapter 19. He's reminding them of the covenant. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. All the power displayed, all the knowledge given, all of them coming to the mountain, and they're terrified. Then verse 22 in Hebrews. But you've come to the Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. What's the company of angels? This is a public thing. You coming to the mountain is a public affair. You think you got things hidden in your life? Ah, uh-uh, it's going to be a public hearing. The hosts of heaven are going to be there. Now, you want to go through every sin in my life and do it publicly in front of people? There's a shame that comes with that. I thought I had that secret thing I was doing. Oh, no. There's nothing in heaven that won't be revealed. There's nothing that won't be shown. There's no hidden part of your life. God sees it all. The heavenly hosts are going to be there. And if you're thinking, oh, I still, I, that's going to be, there's one way out of that whole thing. You just come up when it's your time to stand before God and you say, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. Jesus, take the stage. If you don't let him take the stage in your life right now, he's not going to want to do that. <laughs> you're ashamed of him today. He's going to be ashamed of you. I'm not, taking, I'm not standing in for you. But Jesus, when he does stand in for those faithful saints, he will say, I got this one. I died on the cross. Those sins are forgiven. I can't even remember him anymore. Yeah, nothing's hidden, but I, I, don't, I just don't remember him. It's been wiped. So we're just going to let this person in. Any questions? Good, because we've got a few million people to get through here. <laughs> I hope. The general assembly, the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, it's just angels, assembly, firstborn. They're all there. To God, the judge of all, he's there too. To the spirits of just men made perfect. Boy, I, I want to be one of those. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that spring, speaks better things than that of Abel. We are made for more than sin. Sins, though, the, we start there, but man, that's just the worst place to live your life. Our covenant's so much better than that. It's better than what the Israelites were offered. That's Paul's point. We have a better covenant. A different mountain, same idea. Mount Zion, not Mount Sinai. Different mediator, Jesus, not Moses. But Paul's point is for us to listen on this. Listen because God's coming again. Don't get nervous about what's on your news feed. Listen to this. He, 25, see that you don't refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Man, if you get saved and you're under God's salvation, and God says, get rid of this thing in your life, get rid of it. Listen to that voice. God says, go talk to that person at the store. I need you to give them encouragement. Go talk to that person at the store. Listen to that voice. It's what we call the Holy Spirit. It's very gentle, very soft, just a nudge. You might even be arrogant thinking that's your voice. You're just making that up. No, don't approach that mountain. That's the Holy Spirit putting something in your heart that shouldn't be there. There's no reason for you to talk to that person. There's no reason to give up that sin outside of the calling of the Holy Spirit. Listen to the voice. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he's promised, saying, yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. That little teeny voice you got shook the earth. That trumpet can get louder, and it will. Paul explains himself. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things which are shaken as of the things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. That's all you got left. What can I do? Where should I be? What should I do? Don't be anxious about anything. Look at the birds. God cares for the birds. He'll take care of those. He'll take care of you too. Look at the grass. It withers and fades. We do too. We're mortal. But don't worry about that. God even loves you so much more. He's counted every hair on your head. Some of you more than others. He loves you. The point of all this shaking isn't to terrify. 
It's to let you know that you don't have to be terrified because you have a better mediator, a better covenant, and a better mountain that you stand before. So Moses went down to the people and he spoke to them, just like Jesus did. Moses comes with the law once and it's rejected. Then he comes a second time. Jesus comes once with the new covenant and he's rejected. But he's coming a second time. And he's coming back and we're so close. Hundreds of generations have wished they could be here to see Jesus' second coming. The early disciples prayed for it. They thought it was going to happen in their lifetime. They wanted to be us. Same Holy Spirit in them that's in you right now. They wished they could be you so that they could speak with boldness. Who was just praying about that? They wanted, they, when they got pressure from the Pharisees and people telling them to shut up and stop talking about Jesus so much, you guys are just trying to shake up the world. Yeah, we are, because the world needs to be shaken. And Jesus does that. It's his voice that shakes the world, not us. We're just ambassadors. We're just messengers. I'm going to close on a little bit from Revelation. Well, this is where this is headed. If you want to know, here it is. Jesus is actually going to come again. We're all going to stand before him. It's not changed. Revelation 20, verse 12. I saw the dead. That's not zombies. That's what Hollywood likes to say. These are dead in their resurrected bodies. Me when I'm 25. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged, and out of those things which were written in the book, according to their works. Wait. Wait. My works are not my relationships. What I do is not good enough. So when it says I'm going to be judged according to my works, that will send me to hell. Nothing I do is done out of uh, the purity of Jesus Christ. So when the ground shakes beneath me and I'm judged on my works, I only have one redemption. I only have one call. His name is Jesus. You guys put it on the wall. Just in case you forgot, you know, obey his voice. Indeed, do that. Keep his covenant. Yes, do that. God gives us the plan. Read the word of God. You're nervous? Read the word. He gave it to you. Listen to Moses. I gave him the words. Number two, consecrate yourself. Live different. Be set apart. Take anything in your life that's not a God and get rid of it. It's going to shake. Then wash your clothes. I just highly recommend that on a very physical level. (laughs) But we're talking about the things on the outside. God cares about what's on the inside, but let's take care of getting some order in your life on the outside too. Don't be doing this over here where everybody can see you doing sin and then claim you're a believer. Don't take his name in vain. Clean your clothes. Number four, be ready to go. All right, I'm ready to go. My shoes are on. I got the armor of God on. I'm set up. I'm, come on, come Lord Jesus, come. Come today. I wonder sometimes if he'll come on a Sunday, Right? He wants to know where his people are at on a Sunday. Accept God's boundary. Don't fight God on certain things. Don't try to rationalize your sin in some weird way. Don't do little dances with the scriptures to justify stuff that you clearly know is wrong and the Holy Spirit's telling you that. Accept his boundary. God does everything spiritually. He tells us everything to do. He tells us there's a consuming fire, so we repent, we turn from sin, we embrace the word, we purify, we get ready, we get on guard, and we are set to go. That's it who you are. It's not what you do. Look at this world. It's shaking. You guys, it's shaking. The whole thing is. It makes people nervous. Suicide rates are up. Anxiety is up. If you're, a, if, you're a guidance, if you're a counselor right now, you're making big bucks. You're stacking the bills because so many people need help and counseling. They, the anxiety is there. It's rattling to them to the core. This world will be consumed and we're consuming it ourselves. So where's your trust? Where's your hope? Where does it lie? We have the full revelation of Jesus Christ and that's the result of all this. He who rose on the third day. I'm going to end with a quote from Lyle C. Rawlings. Um, He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He did not live in a castle, yet they called him lord. He ruled no nations, yet they called him king. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet he rose on the third day. His name is Jesus. 
that shakes your ground, good. Should. Be ready. He's coming again. If you are not in a place where this sermon made you feel at peace, there's an anxiety in your heart, please let's pray about it. You know Paul's here. Charlie's here. There's ladies that will pray with you. Um, like, Gather and, and get with God's people and let's pray together. Let's do that. I'm going to hang out up front just to say hi to some folks and whatnot, but boy, if you want somebody to pray with you, I'd, be, I'd love to do that. Um, let's get your heart at ease. Amen? Amen. Let, let's pray. Dear Lord God, we put our lives in your hands. We trust you. And Lord, while the ground's shaking, we just want to dance on it. Um, Lord, because we know our faith is in you, our hope is in you, our life is in you. It's all about you. And Lord, we don't want to stop until we can get ourselves as close to you as possible. But, but Lord, we don't want to go before your throne without your covering. We can't. So Lord, lift us up. Gather to us. Gather us together, Lord, and be with us. Lord, we need you to come down a second time. And we can see that you're orchestrating world events. There's so many world leaders that think they're doing this. But Lord, we know how the heavenly hosts work and influence the history of the world. We know that your hand is in all of this. It's just too aligned. So Lord, we don't miss that. We're, our eyes are wide open, our ears are wide open, and help us to see it. Lord, come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen.